So I want to come everybody. <clears throat> Praise belongs to Allah. We praise him and we ask him for guidance and forgiveness. When we seek protection uh, in Allah from the malice of our own souls and the evil of our actions, whom Allah guides, no one could lead them astray. And whom he makes astray, no one can lead them back to the right path. I bear witness that there is no deity but Allah alone with no partners. And I bear witness that Muhammad is the servant and messenger of Allah. You who believe, be mindful of God, as is his due, and make sure you devote yourselves to him, to your dying moment. Believers, be mindful of God, speak in a direct fashion, and to good purpose, and he will put your deeds right for you and forgive you your sins. Whoever obeys God and his messenger will truly achieve a great triumph. Assalamu alaikum, my dear sisters and brothers. Again, I am blessed and fortunate to be able to be with you um, on this blessed Friday, sharing company, sharing time to reflect on Allah and ourselves and our community and our purpose. And uh, with, you know, so much going on in the world and in our own lives, uh, we don't want to, I don't want to diminish everything that everyone has going on. Um, but I think maybe we can all agree that it's a, it's a bit of a struggle right now. Um, and I, I struggled to sit and organize what I wanted to talk to you all today. And um, I think we're all, many of us are in that same boat, right? Struggling to make sense of what we are witnessing, struggling to keep in the know and aware while also balancing our sanity and mental health, feeling as though we are screaming into the void until we become almost numb and yet seeing no change in the status quo. And on top of that, we've entered the holiday season, right? Uh, although many of us don't necessarily celebrate or participate in all of the festivities, we are in the midst of it nonetheless. So it, it also got me thinking, you know, what have these past five weeks taught us? What lessons can we muster out of what has felt like what we are witnessing is living hell? I have to believe that there is a deeper meaning to the madness of the world. Because in addition to being mortified at seeing the unfolding of a real life genocide, I'm also mortified at some of the rhetoric and lack of human dignity expressed by uh, my Muslim siblings and, and our allies. And so I, I want to take a moment and just sort of maybe take a step back and do some reflection things that I want to share with you, things that, that I've been reflecting on over the last few weeks, because sometimes this feels like it's all too mad to be real. And I think that all too often, many of us fall into certain traps um, and, and certain holes that in the end will get us nowhere. Um, and if we can just be a little bit more intentional in what it is that we are doing, then I think that maybe just maybe we have a chance of gaining some headway towards justice, right? Um, because I think that's really what we all want in the end is justice. And specifically, you know, I am going to talk mainly about what's going on in Palestine, but what I'm about to say can be you know, carbon copied to any situation where there is oppression. Um, but I think as Muslims, we hold a special responsibility um, when it comes to confronting oppression. Um, and so what if we just, if I just pointed out a few things that maybe we can individually sit on, reflect on, after after today, after our my chat, after my talk, I want to give you all um, just some things to sort of maybe reflect on and maybe incorporate. Maybe I'm wrong. Allahu alam, right? I could be totally off the mark on this one. But let's start with this, okay? Because I think that multiple multiple truths can be upheld at the same time. And I think that 
actually once we recognize that what what it is we're actually fighting for, then then we have a chance of pleasing Allah, because this is a test for all of us, but it's not the same test for everyone. And so for I, who I'm speaking to, I'm not speaking to the Palestinians. Okay, I'm speaking to those of us here probably in America, right? That's that's probably who's going to be watching this. So what what are we doing here for those over there who are suffering, right? We got a lot of emotions, we got a lot of feelings. Who are we directing our ang our anger towards, our vengefulness towards? All right? Because we cannot become what we hate in others. Are we being unified? and strategic are we going to be responsible when it comes to rallying up the troops um, in collective anger because i've seen a lot of that i've seen a lot of sort of prominent voices do things and say things that are seemingly rallying the troops right R rallying those who who are feeling helpless but in done in a very irresponsible way right let me get you all angry get you all riled up and then i'm just going to sit back and tell you i don't know i mean i'm not going to offer anything else if you are in a position of leadership and you're doing that or you're witnessing somebody doing that you know we gotta we, we have to stand up against that um who are we unifying with right are we unifying with anyone who shares either a same ethnicity or religious label as we do? Or are we unifying with people who will combat oppressive power wherever they see it, regardless of their ethnic background or religious identity? Um, you know, what, what are we unifying on? I think that's also something, what is that foundation built on? Um, and lastly, you know, where are we getting our information from? So I'm pointing out, I'm sharing things that I've sort of recognized in the last five weeks that I think that we, as a collective group of people who claim to be upholders of justice, that maybe these are areas that we're lacking on. And so if we were to, to sort of sit back and reflect on these things, um, then I think maybe, again, like I said, we might have a chance. And so that's why I titled this talk, you know, I'm thankful for Palestine because it is Palestine, it is what's going on in, in Palestine um, that has awakened us from our amnesia and from our worldly distractions. And I hope that when this all comes out in the end, that we find ourselves on a side that was pleasing to Allah, that we did things that were pleasing to Allah in a way that was pleasing to Allah. So as always, I like to turn to the Quran when I need guidance when there's so much confusion and turmoil and, and it's hard to know where, where to go and who to, who to stand with. Let's just go back to the Quran. And I want to take a look at a section of verses from Surah uh, Ma'ida, uh, Ma so the fifth chapter. And so as a little bit of background, because it's always important to understand not just the verses, but what were the reason of revelation. So this Surah was believed to be revealed after the, the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. And so to go back a little bit more, Battle of Badr occurred in 624, the Muslims won. The following year was the Battle of Uhud. In 625, the Muslims lost. Two years later was the Battle of the Trench. 627, the Muslims won. And this was that very definitive win that gave the Muslim community um, a lot of, of strength, um, a lot of unity, a lot of political strength. Um, and then came the Treaty of Hudaybiyah in 628. And this was a moment where the Muslim community, aside from the Prophet Sallam, felt very defeated, very let down. Of course, in the end, you know, we can look back and, and say, no, no, it was really a blessing. The treaty was really a blessing. But this verse, this, this chapter was revealed around that time, around the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. And at this time, you know, the Muslims had become a ruling body and it was feared that power might corrupt them. 
And at this period of great trial, Allah had admonished them over and over again to stick to justice and to guard against the wrong behavior of their predecessors, the people of the book. They have been enjoined to remain steadfast to the covenant of obedience to Allah and his messenger and to observe strictly their commandments and prohibitions in order to save themselves from the evil consequences, um, the same consequence that had befallen the Jews and the Christians who had violated them. Um, and they had been instructed to observe the dictates of the Holy Quran and to conduct all their affairs and warned against the attitude of hypocrisy. So, okay, so that's the background. So we're going to jump to the 27th verse of the surah, where Allah says to the prophet, tell them the truth about the story of Adam's two sons. Each of them offered a sacrifice, and it was accepted from one and not the other. One said, I will kill you. But the other said, God only accepts the sacrifice of those who are mindful of him, of Allah. So God's refusal to accept the sacrifice of one of the brothers was not due to any wrong the other brother might have committed, but to his lack of piety, right? So hence, rather than attempt to kill his brother, he should have been concerned with cultivating his piety. So that's sort of the tafsir of that verse. So the next verse goes on to say, if you raise your hand to kill me, I will not raise mine to kill you. I fear God, the Lord of all worlds, right? So that's the one brother saying it to the brother whose sacrifice wasn't accepted. And so this doesn't mean that that brother, uh, that his brother assured him that when the latter stepped forward to kill him, he would keep his hands tied and his stretch out his own neck to be cut rather than defend himself. What this statement amounts to is an assurance of the part of the first brother that even though the other was intent on killing him, he himself had no such intention, right? One says, I'm going to kill you. The other says, I'm not going to kill you. I know what you're going to do to me, but I'm not going to kill you just because I know what you're going to do to me, okay? So another lesson from that verse um, says that righteousness does not demand at all that when a man or when a human subjected to wrongful aggression they should surrender to the aggressor rather than defend themselves. Righteousness, however, demands that a person should not take the initiative to try and kill someone, though he knows that that other person is bent on killing them, right? It, it's better to wait for the act of aggression to be initiated by the other person. And that is what was intended by the statement of the righteous son of Adam sit on this right all right the next verse says and i would rather you were burdened with my sins as well as yours and became the inhabitant of the fire such as the evildoers reward right so i said one brother saying i'm not going to kill you i would rather you take my sins and your own sins than than to kill you even though i know what you're going to do to me Then in verse 30, Allah says, but his soul prompted him to kill his brother. He killed him and became one of the losers. Then God sent a raven to scratch up the ground and show him how to cover his brother's corpse. And he said, woe is to me. Could I not have been like this raven and covered up my brother's body? He became re remorseful. All right, so the tafsir of these two verses, verse 30 and 31. The purpose of mentioning this particular incident is to reproach the Jews subtly for the plot that they had hatched to assassinate the prophet and some of his illustrious companions. <clears throat> Sorry, it was the Jews and the companions who had attempted to uh, kill the prophet. So the resemblance between the two incidences, right? The Adam's sons and then what Allah's, who Allah is directing this, these verses to. Um, God honored some of the people of Arabia and disregarded the ancient people of the book because the former were pious and the latter were not. But rather than reflect upon the causes of their rejection by God and to do something to overcome the failings which had led to that rejection, they were seized by the same fit of arrogant ignorance and folly which had once seized the criminal son of Adam and resolved to kill those whose good deeds had been accepted by God. It was obvious that such acts would contribute nothing towards their acceptance of God. They would rather them and rather they would rather earn them an 
even greater degree of God's disapproval. Now, verse 32 of this surah is one of the most powerful verses in the Quran. Allah says, on account of his deed, we decreed to the children of Israel that if anyone kills a person, unless in retribution for murder or spreading corruption in the land, it is if he kills all mankind. While if he if any saves a life, it is if he saves the lives of all mankind. Our messengers came to them with clear signs, but many of them continue to commit excesses in the land. So this verse means that the survival of human life depends on everyone respecting human beings and contributing actively to the survival of protect of, of protection of others. Who whosoever kills unrighteously is thus not merely guilty of doing wrong to one single person, but proves by his act that his heart is devoid of respect for human life and of sympathy for the human species as such. Such a person, therefore, is an enemy of all mankind. This is so because he happened to be possessed by the quality which, were it to become common to all humans, would lead to the destruction of the entire human race. The person who helps to preserve the life of even one person on the other hand, is the protector of all of humanity, for they possess a quality that is indispensable to the survival of mankind. So I want to emphasize a strong point here. When Allah is reprimanding or pointing out the deficiencies of the Jews, Allah is not casting them all as a lost people for all of eternity. Sometimes that point is missed. Common, I'm talking about modern times, that, that point seems to be missed. What Allah is doing is indicating, sorry, Allah, what Allah is not doing is indicating that there's some sort of pathology to their nature or that they're predisposed for certain dislike traits. Rather, Allah is specifically talking about the community of Jews and hypocrites who plotted against the prophet and is pointing out what happens when we break our covenant with Allah. We must read these verses as a reminder to all of us. If we claim to be Muslim, and accept the message of Allah, then we must uphold what Allah has prescribed for us to uphold. Allah says in the Quran, O you who believe, uphold justice and bear witness to God, even if it is against yourselves, your parents, your close relatives. Whether the person is rich or poor, God can best take care of both. Refrain from following your own desire so that you can act justly if you distort or neglect justice, God is fully aware of what you do. You who believe, believe in God and his messenger and in the scripture. He has sent down to his messenger as well as what he has sent before. Anyone who does not believe in God, his angels, his scripture, his messengers, and the last day have gone far, far astray. Those two verses are from Shulto Nisat 135 and 136. I say this saying of mine, and I seek forgiveness from Allah for me and for you and to the rest of the Muslims. So ask him for forgiveness. He is the forgiver, the merciful. Bismillah rahman Bismillah. Walhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salam ala rasulullah. In the name of Allah and exaltations be to Allah and blessings and peace be upon the messenger of Allah. Okay. Okay. So we reviewed, there's a reason why I chose those five verses, right? I'm not going to sit there and explain my reasoning. I think you can take those five verses, five, six verses, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, six verses from Surah to Ma'idah and come to your own conclusion and what Allah is warning us, what Allah is telling us and what we need to be reminding ourselves and each other. When we look at Palestine, and what the Palestinians are enduring, we must recognize that that is not what we are enduring, okay? They have been put through trials and tribulations to a point that very few of us can fathom. It doesn't matter how many videos that you watch of dead children. Whatever we see, it pales in comparison to what they are going through. But our job isn't to sojourn with them simply for the sake of unity. They have been tested and are being tested. And inshallah, God willing, they've already passed their test. However, 
We have been placed in our positions for a reason. And we must determine what that reason is and how we can be successful. Because I don't think we have begun to scratch the surface of our potential to change the status quo of not only the Palestinians, but of all people, regardless of ethnic or religious identity, who are being oppressed. We can't just lump ourselves with the Palestinians and their plight, right? Well, the West hates us. We're doomed. You know, we, we have to separate ourselves. We are here for a reason. And we have powers that they do not. And we need to unify in an effort to solidify and strengthen our abilities to fight back. But it needs to be done in a strategic way. And it needs to be through the lens of justice, justice for all of humanity. So I don't want to go too long, but I, I do want to just point out maybe a couple of things just to be aware of. Okay, I don't want to sit there and be preachy and just just these are just things just please just be aware of this. Again, watching a continual stream of online videos of what's going on in Palestine, if that puts you to to a point where you are in a state of despair or or you become despondent, you need to stop. Right? Degrading yourself and your mental health is not going to help any we also should probably stop looking to political leadership for guidance, be it here in the West or in the Muslim world. We have to recognize that power is a playland for corruption and evil. And we need to figure out a better way to make change. We cannot be careless with our words, right? We have to be mindful of what we are expressing and how we're expressing it and please 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 we cannot fall prey to propaganda because guess what it's everywhere it's on both sides and never stop asking questions always ask learn more become as well versed and know like in the know of what's going on but in a very smart way right? I know we want to do things like going to protests can be very, very, very beneficial. But are there other things that we can be doing as a collective to be making a difference? Boycotting can be very effective. Look at South Africa. Are our boycotts, are they being smart? Are they being targeted? Who are we boycotting? Why are we boycotting them? Are there better ways to boycott? How can we use whatever potential we have and wield that power against those who are decision makers. And lastly, I want to I want to read a poem. And this poem was written, whoops. This poem was written by one of my cousins. It's a very powerful poem. And um, her grandfather uh, was a very well-known Palestinian academic um, here in the States. Um, so she wrote this poem, and I think I want to close with this poem. Today my prison is my cell phone, trapped under the rubble of photos and videos of Palestinian children trapped under, oops, sorry, trapped under the rubble of photos and videos of Palestinian children trapped under the rubble of teenage boys who look like my brother, carrying dead teenage boys who look like my brother. What you call defense is the destruction of generations, of land older than time, a fruit of zaytun, of Arabic coffee, land that births holy life, even as the world tells them die. I'm starving, or rather I'm not eating, because no matter what or how much I eat, my body still feels empty. Look, look what we can do to you, shouts the state. Look, look how we can reduce your life to nothing, whisper the media. They can obliterate you, me with bombs, so they try to obliter obliterate, obliterate me into silence. Look at you, terrorist, says the man on the television. I was nine years old and afraid. I turned off the TV. I began typing into Google, are Palestinians terrorist? The phrase auto-populates before I finish, terrorist. They say in between dropping, bomb, dro dropping white phosphorus bombs that light up the darkness of an unlit Gaza, 
no electricity, no internet, no food, no water, no leaving, no staying. Who controls the Gaza Strip, Hamas? I wonder what terrorism looks like to Palestinians, Iraqis, Yemenis, Syrians, Afghanis, Libyans, Pakistanis. Who do they see on TV bombarding them with bombs and justifications? You tell us we are paying for our sins. Do you intend to pay for yours? I think about the first time I ever saw mass desecration of human life on television. It was a movie about the Holocaust. I never forgot it. I vowed to myself that I would never, ever, ever be a person who said nothing, did nothing. I could not believe the stories of those who kept Jewish children alive in cupboards, preserving life alongside preserved jams and teacups that were allowed to rattle more so than the child. I think about our African ancestors who, after building an entire country, built underground railroads to freedom since they could not walk it above. I think about how indigenous peoples in America, diluted to less than 1% through the wicked poison of colonialism, continue to protect the land, continue to, to, to teach life. While I write this, I get a text from my dad. Israel is now using the most extensive bombing they have ever used in or outside of Gaza City. Continuous heavy bombing. There will be hundreds of, and thousands of Palestinian deaths that come from this. CNN is filming it live, he adds. There is no time to feel small. A small child in Gaza is killed at the equivalent of once every 10 minutes. One for the time it takes me to make my breakfast in the morning, two for my shower, three for my run, thousands in my sleep. Ola, please accept our good deeds and our good intentions. Forgive our shortcomings and missteps and allow us to experience many more moments together. O Allah, grant us the good things in this world and the good things in the next life and save us from the punishment of the fire. O Allah, aid us in accepting the tests and tribulations of this life and give us the strength to overcome any challenge we may face. O Allah, rid us of our anxiety, our despair, our sorrow, and replace in us a sense of serenity and tranquility. O Allah, we ask you to place peace and solace in the hearts of those suffering any injustice. O Allah, we hope for your mercy, do not leave us to ourselves, even for the blinking of an eye. Correct each of our affairs for us. There is none worthy of worship but you. If I have said anything of truth, it is from Allah alone, and my gratitude goes to him. And if I said anything that was not of truth, then that is from my own ego, and I ask for forgiveness from that transgression.